tonight, which is what we're going to be talking about tonight. But there's a plurality of forms of government. There are federal governments, there are parliamentary governments, there are more aristocratic or autocratic governments. There are com governments based on a communist party. There are, commun there are governments that seem to be democratic but are not really democratic, like in Mexico, where at least Mexico up to the you know, uh, 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 10 years ago, where the same party won the elections every time, and when the president that was, was the outgoing president picked his successor, knowing that he was going to win. How is that supposed to be a democracy, right? So, there's all kinds of governments, and what we need, just like with the species, what we need to know is how is the variation distributed, right? Yesterday we talked about that. We're not, we're not concerned about what all of them have the same what, what they, they share the same, what essence do they have in common? There are no essences. What we need to know is, you know, they, they certainly belong to, to a group, but they are all varied. And so what we need to know is, what is the statistical distribution of the variation? It's an entirely different approach. We're not just changing words. Okay? I mean, that's important because, of course, all I'm doing right now is writing words, and it might seem that I'm reducing everything to language. But I'm giving you examples about practice, about people staging demonstrations and extracting rights from the state, about people interacting in communities, making promises, uh, 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 re reciprocating favors, which are not linguistic. Right? Because I said, in a community, talk is cheap. What counts is action. Actions speak louder than words. You pay back your favors, you reciprocate your, you, you honor your commitments, they respect you. You dishonor your commitments, they don't respect you. Whatever you say. Right? So I'm giving you examples of action, but of course I'm using words to talk about it. But that, that would, it would be kind of tricky to blame me for that, unless you want me to start talking with like sign language. <laughs> no, I'm just thinking about the doing away with concepts entirely. Um, and while you know the, the Indian argument definitely seems to uh, well, no, but you also, you know, one problem with Hume is that he basically concentrated at this level. Yeah. When he talks about social matters, and he just jumps directly to society as a whole. But society as a whole it doesn't exist. There is no such thing as society as a whole. Or there's no such thing as the American people. What is that? The American people. The entire population. But then why do we need a word for something so varied? So many ethnic communities, so many different fractures among communities in the Northeast, communities in the South, more religious and less religious. So le leave that to politicians who do need to just speak with rhetoric and say the American people have decided. You know. But us as thinkers, we should not be falling into those traps. Right? Particularly if we really want to eventually... I want to have to stop this answer right now just to write one more thing that I need, unfortunately I need it very importantly for tonight's discussion, okay? Now, in the previous diagram, I discussed all these different entities that are emergent wholes made out of interacting parts as if they were disembodied, as if they were not situated in space. Now, some of those entities, like the well or or communities in MySpace or communities in Facebook are disembodied. And in fact, they are not located in any space except cyberspace. But the majority of those other entities do have buildings within which they operate, which exist in neighborhoods, some of which are government districts and have a lot of government buildings in that neighborhood, some of which are commercial districts and have a lot of stores, some of which are industrial districts and have a lot of factories, some of which are residential neighborhoods and have a lot of houses. So they are not only embodied with a, in a particular mineral structure, with particular machines uh, in which the day-to-day -day practices occur, but they are also situated in space. Most of them, not all of them. With the advent of mass or, or long distance communications, like the telephone, well, no, the postal service to begin with, the telephone, then radio, then television, then the internet, the possibility to create dispersed communities and even in some cases dispersed organizations uh, was what became a possibility. But we still have a lot of communities like SASFE, which is located in a specific place at the end of the world, apparently. 
You know, you fly eight hours and take a three hour train and an hour bus. It's like, are we there yet? Jesus. So, I need to add something about spatiality. I need to add something about the, the locales within which many of those practices take place, even though we all agree that with the telephone and the postal service and the internet, certain practices can take place at a distance. The telegraph is another example, and the railroad is another example. Something that made possible, uh, say, corporations that have a, a, a main brand, a, a branch, but then many branches all along, all, all distributed across the United States, and the organization is really the entire set of organizations, not just the main branch. So, accepting that, let me draw a simplified diagram of how this would be. It needs to be a part to whole relationship. So at the bottom of it all we have buildings, houses for people, office buildings for, for offices, the lower floors for retail, larger warehouses for uh, wholesale, uh, the, the White House, the, the Congress, the, the, the building for Congress and so on, different buildings, specific buildings, now, many buildings, and I'm going to draw first my arrows, that are the emergence arrows, form a neighborhood, many neighborhoods and districts form a city, Several cities organize what is called a geographical region. This is not a standard term, it varies from country to country. Several regions form a province. Again, this is not a standard term. In the United States, we call this states. But in, in Europe, they are called provinces. And finally, several different provinces form what we might call a territorial state. Which can be a variety of things. It can be empires, it can be kingdoms, it can be nation states, and others. And what I want to read here an exhaustive list. There are territorial states in the sense that they they join together several provinces of several states. In the case of the United States, the provinces were the third, the original 13 states after the War of Revolution, or the War of Independence, as it should be called, really. It wasn't a revolution, it was a War of Independence. They came together and they formed the United States. Then other colonies kept adding themselves up. But once some of them began to disagree with the federal government, they threatened to secede. So, okay, they, threat, they threatened to break up the territory into two. And you had civil war to keep them together. So now, let me add my other arrows before I start getting brief for this. <laughs> By you know who. <laughs> and I'm going to even want to make him a different color.